All right, we are thrilled to be talking to author William Hazelgrove. He wrote the great book, Henry Knox's Noble Train, the story of a Boston bookseller's heroic expedition that saved the American Revolution. And I've just got to say that for for folks in New England, the, the job that's so Belichickian, <laughs> back when the Patriots were good, just the, the, the job that Henry Knox did in doing his job, fulfilling his role, that really saved the revolution. But we'll get into all that stuff. Thrilled to talk to you, uh, William. Thanks for joining us. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, um, so I've been reading this. Um, I've been, you know, somewhat aware of the Henry Knox story in passing. You know, it's it's funny because it made such a huge difference, but somehow it gets, like, glossed over in the history books. You know, kids don't learn it to the same extent they learn about Lexington and Concord or... You know, the, these kind of big battles of the revolution, like my kids can name Bunker Hill, but I don't know if they would come up with Henry Knox, um, you know, if you ask them to name big events and people of the revolution. But it really, the importance almost can't be understated. So I was so happy um, when Tom said we got this book from you that um, that really covered this event in detail. And, um, you know, what, what brought you to this event as something that was worth writing a whole book on when it's really, it's not as big or as well-known an event in the revolution. Um, well, you know, you're absolutely right. It's, it's been overlooked uh, and it shouldn't be because I discovered it reading David McCullough's 1776, mm -hmm. which by the way, you know, that's how I discover a lot of topics reading other people's books where I'm like, okay, what is the same thing when I wrote Madam President, The Secret Presidency of Edith Wilson? Right. That was uh, Berg's book on Wilson that, you know, piqued my interest. At any rate, um, on this, uh, you know, I was like, okay, so he did what? And so then when I started to investigate it, as you said, there's only children's books on it. Mm -hmm. um, nobody has really gone after it. Um, and so, I, you know, I dug deeper. And what I found out was this was an incredible expedition, um, you know, where this man dragged 120,000 pounds of cannons uh, 300 miles in the dead of winter in 1775, all the way to George Washington. And, and this was the reason Washington was able to get his first victory over the British. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, there's absolutely no doubt as you go through the story that Henry Knox's amazing this bookseller from boston who had no military experience at all he's in his 20s big guy today we call him sort of overweight um you know sort of garrulous has this big can-do spirit but he really pulled it out and made the difference uh getting you know general howell and the the uh redcoats out of boston yeah it's um it's sort of incredible. It's funny you mentioned the David McCullough book because that's where I really first realized how big a deal this was, too. And it's funny, you know, Boston celebrates evacuation day of the British leaving and all this stuff. And, you know, it, it's we're aware that the British left Boston, but sort of how huge a deal it was that in that day and age, without the benefit of modern technology, he brought these cannons to Boston this long distance. It's really sort of overlooked. So when I read that in the David McCollum book, I had the same experience you did, which is like, why isn't this a bigger deal? This is incredible. And so I'm, I'm, it's, I'm so glad that you took the time to then dig deeper and dig out all these primary and secondary sources um, that we have on this event. Um, because because people should realize what a big deal this is. And I don't know, um, you you talk about Henry Knox and his background and his younger life. And um, and I don't know, is your impression, is he sort of this unique figure in history the way George Washington is? You know, a lot of people think of George Washington that way, that there couldn't have been an America and an American Revolution and all this without without George Washington. And then he's sort of this almost mythical figure he's bigger than a larger than life kind of character is henry knox the same way is he a unique person could someone else could george washington have sent any one of the sort of boston uh revolutionaries and and could they have done this job that knox did or is he special the same way washington is sort of special well you know washington was just a uh a planter when mm -hmm. he came to take over the continental army 
which right. wasn't even an army. It was like a collection of militias. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, he, he had shown that he had some military experience and that, you know, he, he had some idea, but he had no idea how to lay siege. So, right. um, but saying that, you know, Washington was a little bit of superhuman and, you know, in, even at this point where he had this superhuman sort of strength, energy, uh, there's just something about him. Now, Henry Knox, let's talk about him. Mm -hmm. Henry Knox was, you know, a guy whose father left him very early um, right. and he supported his family. And, um, you know, he's a bookseller and he sold books and he had a good bookstore in Boston. It was very successful. He, um, he you know, he managed to uh, put blurbs on books. Nobody had done that before. He undercut people mm -hmm. on price. Um, and he was doing very well. Now he sort of gets radicalized during this time. Right. You know, Sam Adams and others kind of go through his store. His store becomes sort of a salon. And uh, he marries Lucy Flucker, who was a, actually the daughter of a royalist uh, um, who was way up in the, the British government. And uh, so, you know, he's a guy who's reaching up. They, they escape Boston uh, under the cover of night because uh, they hear that Henry's going to get arrested because the word's out. He's this rebel sympathizer. And uh, he joins Washington's army, just, you know, a guy who's read some books on the military, but hasn't really, uh, has no real experience. He's sort of trained with a battery of uh, artillery a few times, but no real experience. So he, he built some uh, breastworks at Roxbury. Washington goes to see the, the fortifications he builds, bumps into Henry on the road. And um, in a strange meeting, he's very taken with this guy. Washington liked uh, young officers who had a can-do spirit, mm -hmm. um, and that was Knox. So Knox, you know, Knox is a very uh, confident guy and who believes, you know, he can do just about anything. And this appeals to uh, Washington, so he takes him on. And then Knox finds out, you know, a couple of things happen. One is Washington makes him in charge of the artillery, and Knox says, uh, Henry says, well, Where's the artillery? And Washington says, well, you don't have any. And so um, then Knox hears about, you know, the 59 cannons, 60 tons, 120,000 pounds of cannons up in Fort Ticonderoga, uh, 300 miles away. And he and Washington sort of decide, well, let's get those. And of course, everybody thinks that he's crazy. There's like, how are you going to do this? And he has no idea how he's going to do it. But, you know, in answer to your question, I think during the revolution, you know, we live in a time where mm -hmm. money is mostly preeminent. That's everybody's motivation. Um, but at this time, people were very religious. Um, and Henry Knox believed in the cause in a religious way that God huh. uh, meant for the United States to become independent. And so to him, it's almost a holy quest. Mm -hmm. But how does he, so he's got relatives who are, like you said, royalists. He lives in a country at this time that's still largely loyalist, um, and he's part of what's an impossible task. How does he roll the dice to throw it all away? At this point, it was throwing it all away. They weren't, they weren't going to win against the British. So how does he get his wrap his mind around that? Or was he just, like you said, just such a radical that he was just a true believer? Um. You know, he in that, at that time, the way to move up in the world was through the military. It was sort of like becoming a rock star is today. Um, you know, this would bring you glory, could bring you fame, could bring you riches. Um, and so, you know, his wanting to join the military, wanting to join Washington's army was motivated by, you know, his uh, fervor for the cause. But also, too, it, it's, it's a way to sort of for a young man to advance in society. So you, you throw all these things together. And yes, when he left Boston with Lucy, they rode out under the car. They rode out in a little boat in the cover of night, going past these British man of wars. Mm -hmm. Right then, uh, you know, he could be hung for treason. Mm -hmm. And so he they he did roll the dice. They did put it all on the line. Um, but Henry's a romantic figure. He had his uh, index finger uh, shot off from a hunting accident, and he always has a colorful scarf wrapped around his left hand to cover it up. Um, he has this little long hair. He's very gregarious, you know, and he gets caught up in things. So he's caught up in the cause, you know, he, he actually, had, just for your listeners to know, he had stumbled into the Boston massacre while it was going. And that really sort of 
made him committed to the idea that the United States had to be independent. So when he joined Washington's army, I mean, Washington's army is a mess, you know, uh, there's disease, um, there's, you know, there's no real organization, people are leaving, they just walk off. Um, it's really a collection of militias. So Washington knows when you lay siege to a, uh, an army occupying a city like the British, you need artillery. So you, you need something to dislodge them. And the British, under General Howe, knew Washington had nothing. In fact, the British don't even take, you know, the Americans seriously, nor do they take Washington seriously. Uh, you know, the way gentlemen fought a war then was during the summer, if you would fight, mm -hmm. a little in the fall, in the winter, you would take it off. Well, Howe and everybody's basically going to the theater and eating nice restaurants in Boston, and they figure in the spring we'll just obliterate the Americans because uh, they have – you know, more reinforcements <laughs> coming in. And uh, yeah, so, so you know, they, they get to, um, uh, you know, they're, they're thinking is there's no way Washington can do anything. Now, we should talk about Dorchester Heights as we also talk about Henry Knox getting ready to go on this expedition. Uh, Dorchester yeah. Heights is the sort of cliffs that are nearby Boston and they overlook Boston, right? Well, the British hadn't occupied them, nor had the Americans. And how's attitude is, well, if the Americans occupy it, we'll just take it back. But <laughs> if you did have cannons and you could put them up there, then you could really be a danger to the British because you could lob shells into the city and you could lob shells into the British Navy. But again, the Americans don't have any artillery except for these 59 cannons sitting up in Fort Ticonderoga. But on November 15th, Henry Knox strikes out to go get him, uh, having no idea how he's going to do it. So no idea he's going to do it, but there's also got to be, I, I assume there's got to be intel, uh, I, spies everywhere, you know, colonial spies and British spies and and just people who want to dime out these rabble rousers who are about to try to destabilize the country. I mean, uh, other than that, I can't imagine that they, had, they were carrying around bribe money. How does he avoid... Uh, getting, you know, having a time dropped on him? Uh, well, great question. Um, all right, so Henry Knox takes off, and he's making his way up toward, you know, Fort Ticonderoga. Um, and you're right. There's tons of spies. And, you know, America's maybe, you know, 40% of best wants to break with Britain. The rest of everybody's like, no. And, you know, half the colonies haven't sent their representatives to the Continental Congress. So this whole thing is hanging by a nice edge. Well, the spies tell the British. They go, listen, the Americans are up to something. We, you know, they're, they're, I think we're, they're going up to Ticonda Road to try and get these cannons. The British, because their hierarchy is based on aristocracy, that's how you became an officer. You had to be basically an aristocrat. Everybody else was just serfs. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't believe the spies. They're like, you're crazy. We don't believe you. And so it would never <laughs> make its way up. To the, to the people who could do anything. Broken so intel, that, I guess, is not well, a new thing. No, no. And also, uh, also they had to deal with the Indians. Mm. And, um, you, know, uh, you know, the Indians were a real danger, too. And um, so, you know, these are all things. You're absolutely right. Henry Knox could have been knocked off in a second. Right. They, they, you know, some uh, Tories could have just said, no. A local militia said, no, you guys are done. But because it's so outrageous that somebody would go in the dead of winter and, and go over all these, you know, this terrain that's just wild uh, and try and get these cannons, nobody believes somebody would do that. They would, they, they would believe that's crazy, and especially the British who are, again, ensconced in Boston and just chilling out for the winter. It's interesting. So um... – I wonder, first of all, when you say just chilling out for the winter, it, it, these guys, how is and the upper crusts of the British um, command are having a good time, right? There there are women, yeah. there's booze, there's, it's a fun winter for them generally. Yes, so absolutely. And so that's another reason probably I yeah. assume why they're well, like, yeah. you know, you know, maybe we won't exactly, let's wait till the... Let's wait till uh, spring, you know, where it's uh, it, right now things are, are uh, comfortable here. Yeah. And I mean, 
here's the thing. And so this is so this is what Knox is doing. So Knox gets all the way up <laughs> to Fort George, and and you know to to pull these back, he's going to have to use ninety oxen and forty five sleds. So he gets all the way up to Fort George, and now he's got to go across Lake George, all right? Because uh, Fort, Ty- Fort Ticonderoga sits on the intersection between, actually it sits on Lake Champlain, but there's like a portage up to it. Mm. Um, and so, you know, things go pretty easily. They, they get up there, they get across the lake, and they get to the fort, and the people in the Fort Ticonderoga are amazed to see him because they're like, what are you doing coming up here in the dead of winter? And he's like, we're coming up to get these cannons. So now they they float, put them all on bateaus, which are these sort of big flat boats. Mm-hmm. Um, and and, you know, again, it's 60,000 pounds. And for your listeners, that's the equivalent of eight SUVs, okay, fully loaded. So they put all these these heavy cans, some weigh 5,000 pounds, and then they head back down Fort George or Lake George. Now a winter storm hits. Now, Lake George is mostly frozen. There's just a little section that's not in the middle. Oh, great. But the wind is incredible. So now they have to pull themselves along. They can't use sails or anything else. And it gets worse some of the boats sink. Now, anybody else would have been like, okay, well, that cannon went to the bottom of the lake, forget it. Henry Knox stops, and they pull him back up, you know, incredible. just through incredible effort using uh, using pulleys and rope and all these crazy things to, to get these cannons back up from the bottom of the lake. Um, finally, they get to Sabbath Island, which is like sort of a halfway point, and there's Indians and the Indians look hostile, but they turn out to actually help them. Um, and then they continue on. And it's just, it's painstaking. You know, it takes, you know, a week just to get back to Fort George across this river. And so, again, some several cannons uh, sink. But Knox gets to Fort George, and he writes a couple of letters. One, he writes to his wife, Lucy, and says, look, this is going to take longer than I thought. Because he never really told her what he was doing. And and then he writes a letter to George Washington, and he says, "I've gotten here. Now I'm going to try and get the sleds and oxen and come down to you know Boston." And and he says, "I'm on the way with your noble train of artillery, um, which is where you know the title of the book comes, but and is how it's known. But you know this is where he elevates it almost to a religious quest because he talks about you know this isn't for us. This is for the unborn millions. So he's using what." we call today teensters these guys will help him through all these crazy mm-hmm. shenanigans he gets you know the oxen the sleds and he starts down and he has to cross the hudson four times the frozen hudson and go through the berkshire mountains um as well and the hudson is no joke if people have seen it actually right right exactly and, and, exactly and so the Hudson's frozen, and so when they go to, to cross, they cross the first time with what's called a Big Bertha cannon, which is a 5,000-pound cannon. And the Teamsters walk next to the oxen with a, an axe and ready to slash the ropes if the ice cracks. Mm. When well, they get the first crossing, things go okay. The second crossing, the ice cracks. The cannon goes down. The, you know, the Teamster swings the axe, cuts the ropes. But now the cannon's down there, but they still have one rope left to it. And again, anybody else would have left it, Knox, you know, pulls it back to the surface, and they continue on. So, you know, they, they've cro- they made it across Lake George. They made it across the Hudson. They crisscrossed the Hudson a few more times. And, oh, by the way, and he, Knox is very innovative. He drills holes into the ice so the water can come up and slop over and refreeze. So he kind of creates ice roads to get oh. these cannons across. All right. And I mean, these guys are not in polar gear. This is incredibly no. cold. But you know? just you, in if you if you've ever even been ice fishing in polar gear, it's still windy as hell. And if you have the element right. of it getting wet at all, if you've broken through the ice at all. That oh, is- absolutely. I mean, these guys are freezing. I mean, this is turned into a Herculean uh in, you know, it's an expedition. Basically, it's almost a polar expedition now. And these guys are these these teamsters who make their living moving freight, um, you know, for the armies and such like that, are really ha- almost had enough. And so when they finally get to the Berkshire Mountains, which are these just frozen cliffs, um, you know, Knox, Knox kept a little diary, and that's what I used a lot 
Oh, okay. But you know, he's, he, he was literally writing it as he was going. And he said, you know, I could see all the kingdoms of heaven, you know, from these mountains. But he said, I have no idea how men in uh, iron can get up these mountains. He had no idea how to cross them. He, he's making all this up as he goes, which is very much the American Revolution. And so they hit the Berkshire Mountains, and it's awful. Um, the, the air gets thin, uh, pulling these mountain, these these cannons up these sheer cliffs. They have to use block and tackle. A lot of times the cannons go right back down the mountain. It's very dangerous. Jesus. Finally, they get they It's get funny, the William, before we go on, yeah. by the way, we're talking uh, to William Hazelgrove. The book is called Henry, Knox, Henry Knox's Noble Train, the story of a Boston bookseller's heroic expedition that saved the American Revolution. Y- your book and all of these scenes so far – Make me nervous. <laughs> Just thinking about going crossing the ice with the cannons and falling in, how cold that would be. Getting a GD cannon up the the Berkshire Mountains, up the sides, as and then they're falling. I mean, imagine just lifting a couch up your stairs. But this is these are tons of mach- of, of these of of these uh, pieces of equipment. Easily, you could get maimed and killed in a second here, for what seems to be a religiously focused but pra- practically impossible task. Oh, yes. Yeah, no, it, it goes against all reason to do something like this. I mean, you know, nobody thought he'd come back. Washington's war council said this is the stupidest thing you could ever do. <laughs> they told Washington this. They said, That's- we're going to lose money on it. We're going to waste time. He'll never come back. I mean, they, they just said flat, he'll never make it back. <laughs> so here he is up in the mountains, and sure enough, they can go no further. Mm. And all the Teamsters say, you know what, we're done. We're done. We're, we're leaving these right up here in the mountains, and we're leaving. Knox realizes this is it. Why? And by the way, Washington needs these cans now. He's been sending out messengers saying, where's Knox? I need these. He really does. Because mm. uh, the British you know, can attack him any time and just wipe him out. And so he's he's put everything on getting these cannons. So Knox realizes this is the moment of truth that, you know, if he loses the team, he's, he's done. And so he, he basically talks and he gives a speech and for about an hour or two. And he says, you know, this is bigger than us. This is something that the unborn millions will understand and it's for them. It's for those that are to come, this country that we're forming. And your part in it is critical right now. And he gets them moving again. And, and Knox is a very inspirational man. And so, you know, they finally, finally get through the Berkshires. And then they're going through these small towns. And now the reputation of the noble train is growing in these small yeah. towns. And people turn out. And they give them food and celebrate, and Knox fires off a few of the cans. But to these people <laughs> who never leave their towns, it's like seeing astronauts, you know, because these this massive artillery, these big bearded men coming through, and everybody knows it's for the revolution. So the country sort of coalesces around it. Finally, finally, Knox gallops ahead. Washington is coming out of his, you know, office, his, his headquarters. And he sees this guy galloping up, covered in snow, with this huge beard, and he can't believe it's Henry Knox. Hmm. And so they pull in January 27th. They pull in all the cannons. Now they pull into Cambridge the British, uh, to, to the headquarters where Washington is. Yeah. Okay. Outside, yeah. So, so outside of Boston. So for your listeners, the British are holding Boston. The Americans are sort of just on the outside in a ring. All right. So. Howell has been getting many, many reports that the Americans are up to, they're pulling these cannons up. He discounts all of it. Okay. Jesus. So what Washington does is in one night, he pulls up all the cannons to Dorchester Heights. Now remember Dorchester Heights is that those big cliffs overlooking Boston. And one night, all 59 cannons, you know, 120,000 pounds, 60 tons up using the oxen and sleds again, an impossible feat. They get them up there. And at dawn, Henry Knox unleashes his bombardment. And basically, houses just start blowing up into just balls of flame. Hal, who's in bed with his concubine, rolls out, (laughs) runs into the street 
stares up at the skyline and sees all these cannons. And he can't believe it. He can't believe it. And he says later, it would take my men 15 months to do this. So where is, and, so where is the, where, where is Knox shooting? I mean, just into the. He sh- right, so Knox is, sh- is lobbing shells into Boston. Okay. From Dorchester Heights. And he's also lobbying shells at the British man of wars. Hmm. And those are the big the battleships Admiral, essentially. Yeah. The ships. And so the Admiral says to general Howe, you have to get him down from there or we're out. We're, we're leaving because the 5,000 pound cannons can lob a shell about a mile or two. And so it's, it'll be a lucky shot, but they're vulnerable. So Hal puts all his troops into boats to go attack Dorchester Heights. Washington's ready for him though. He's got all these cannons. He's got his entire army ready to just pour down all this shot and, and the musket fire onto Hal and his troops. But what happens is a Northeaster hits right then when the troops are in the harbor and blow and literally blows them out, just sort of blows them back. So it, the attack doesn't even happen. How's war council says, you got to leave. We've got to go because these guys are just going to keep shelling us. And the, you know, the Navy's not going to stay and we can't use them to get out. So how lets Washington know, he says, if you don't molest me and I will not burn Boston to the ground and we're going to leave. And Washington says, okay. And so then 10,000 redcoats abandoned Boston along with like 3,000 loyalists because they all figured they're, they're going to be you know, hung when Washington comes in. And this incredible armada leaves giving the Americans and, – and Knox watches this all from the top of the cliff. And little does Howe understand that this guy, this big guy with his long hair and beard is the reason – he got forced out of Boston and the Americans got their first victory of the revolution. That is fascinating. So, and I think that people have to think of, of the political aspect of this, that the British Navy, the pride of the British empire, you know, didn't come to new England to be sunk and blown to pieces. I mean, these are expensive, expensive uh, vessels um, in that it would have been political hell to pay had they been slaughtered and decimated in Boston Harbor. Yeah. Well, and, and here's the thing, Tom, is that after this victory, the French start entertaining the thought of supporting the Americans, coming to the war on the American side. Because to the world, Britain's a superpower, which she is, and they just assume Britain would just crush the Americans. Well, suddenly... The Americans forced the British out of Boston and all the colonies that were on the fence, all are like, we're in, we're, mm. we're good. We're good for, you know, independence. So it coalesces the American revolution at the time when it could have just fragmented and fallen apart. If, if Washington had been defeated at Boston, the American revolution would have really had a hard time staying together because it was just held together with just it, bailing wire at this point. <laughs> but this victory amazes people and lets the world know, oh, this is could be something different and that the British are vulnerable. And, you know, Knox will stay with Washington all the way through crossing the Delaware to Yorktown. And it, well, in, you say that the crossing the Delaware and we talked about before getting up to Ticonderoga to get the cannons, et cetera, that had been thought of a, as an impossible plan and it would never work. So I, I think probably – the conventional wisdom on the British side as well is that these idiots aren't going to go to 200 miles away and grab tons of cannons and bring them across the Hudson River and lakes, etc. So how much did this incredible mission, Knox is grabbing those cannons and bringing them to Dorchester Heights, how much did that go into making that the template of the war, fighting the asymmetrical hard way? Well, you know... The Americans realized very quickly that unconventional warfare would be their best tool. Mm. And that is that, you know, the British stood up, you know, shoulder to shoulder and fired musket volleys. The Americans didn't do that. The Americans were more like the Viet Cong. We would sort of melt into the forest. We'd shoot behind walls, and which is good because we're really good shots. Um, and so Washington was an interesting commander. You know, he's a phlegmatic guy in a way. I mean, he, he led a very routine life. He ate the same thing for breakfast every day. You know, he 
went and saw his farms. He had the same kind of dinner. Um, he, he would go to bed early, always rise very early. But inside him was this wild man hmm. who would do these crazy Hail Mary things just when everybody thought, oh, Washington's just, you know, he's not much. And that's really what people are thinking of him at Boston. And, and then suddenly he would just do this very risky maneuver that would catch the British flat-footed that would change the equation of the war, which is the crossing of the Delaware, uh, sending Henry Knox up to get the cannons. Um, You know, it's like just when they thought, okay, we've got him, he would do something just, you know, that was very sort of running against the grain to use a football uh, analogy. And, um, and this was his sort of secret weapon. This was his brilliance, if you will, um, because he, in a lot of ways, he wasn't a great commander at times. A lot of times he, he made bad decisions. Hmm. But this, um, you know, these, these moments where he would reverse the equation of war were very critical. And it was really the, his, the only way they could deal with the British. Yeah, and you, and you think about that, this, these low probability missions, um, you, you know, probably including getting the cannon up to Dorchester Heights and, you know, uh, crossing into in was it was a Christmas Eve when they attacked the Hessians, when they attacked the Hessians. Yeah, um, right. You, you know, things yes. like that where it's low probability of success. But if there's failure, it's the end of the entire movement. These are like Hail Marys on third and 20. Yeah. And, and Washington would always sort of slip out of the British grasp just right. when they thought they had him cornered. I mean, he went to Morristown in 1779 and the British, um, I've got another book coming out um, called Morristown, the plot to kidnap George Washington. The British uh, took advantage of this incredible winter where the Hudson froze totally solid very early. And Washington was sitting up in Morristown. His army was not doing well. They were freezing. They didn't have food. Uh, actually, it was much worse than Valley Forge. And um, and so the British are like, let's go get him. And they launched this huge force to basically go up, catch Washington, and kidnap him and, you know, cut off the head they saw it of the movement and that, you know, figured that that would end the American Revolution. And again, at the last moment, Washington reversed course and, and you know, made these moves that uh, the British just couldn't anticipate. They, they couldn't find them. And, um, and then immediately when they finally did attack them in mass, Washington was able to beat them back again. So he was, he was sort of this slippery guy who would just sort of slip out of their clutches every time they thought they had him. But a lot of that is because Washington – Two things. One, Washington had incredible stamina. He had a, a strange pressing ability to make the right move just when everything looked awful. And uh, the British, you know, finally started to respect him toward the end of the war because most of the war they they thought he was just, a, you know, this rebel leader. And, uh, you know, the whole time, of course, he's being influenced by Henry Knox, who's he's aide de camp. Um for not for the duration, right? At some point, did, did Knox have his own um, yeah, command? Well, all right. So, and this kind of goes to uh, what your wife was saying earlier: um, why people don't know Henry Knox. Henry Knox was overshadowed by Washington and these other big towering figures of the Revolution. Yet he was always there. And, you know, he expanded the artillery. He was he was integral to the attack. You know, across the Delaware. Um, you know, when the Hessians came pouring out of the barracks, he had a cannon lined up just mowing them down um, <laughs> all the way to York, you know. And so then after after the war, he became the first secretary of war in the cabinet, uh, in Washington's uh, government. And then finally, after that, he said, you know, I, I, I'm going to kind of go out on my own. I want to try and make some money, you know, because he, he was always he never was able to do that. So he got a uh, mansion up in Maine, and uh, but he wasn't a good businessman, and he and his wife had kind of some hard times, and then uh, he died fairly early um, from an infect throat infection, and um, his wife uh, died destitute. Jeez. Um, and so you know we have Fort Knox, uh, 
and you know we, we we have a few things that we can point to but he he was sort of lost to in the annals of history and actually, and now there's all these markers that you can actually go follow the Henry Knox trail huh. in a car huh. you know they put him up in the 1920s um but uh, but you know one reason he was eclipsed was because of the mythical almost deistic personality of George Washington just fascinating fascinating stuff um it, uh, just another small question were they in uniform when when they were moving during the noble train uh, you know period getting the cannons you know he had some he had some militia with him uh they were basically composed of militia the teamsters henry knox and his brother william um so you know the the militia were as as were you know, Washington's army was sort of a hodgepodge of different things in, in terms of uniforms. And uh, he had to actually have soldiers put feathers in their caps to kind of know who they were and were wear armbands in the beginning to know what rank they were. So, you know, most of these guys were wearing homespun, you know. And uh, so, you know, they're trudging through snowdrifts and this and that with moccasins and things like that you know it was which he, is amazing you know um it, it, but uh just to the loyalty of yeah. his troops to him and it seems to me to go through that they must have been extremely loyal you know you hear about um general burgoyne who actually was kind of in the same area at one point um you know on his uh big um you know, Corvette, you know, with his uh, rum and, uh, you know, women with them, et cetera, and, and living the high life, never being on the ground with the men. Uh, no Knox was more of a hands-on, in-the-trenches kind of guy? Yeah, I mean, Henry was uh, very much in the front lines all the time. I mean, uh, you know, with his artillery. And, you know, firing a cannon was a very complicated thing in 1775. Um, you know, you had to prime it. You had to uh, put this canister of powder, basically a cloth bag of powder, you know, down the muzzle. Uh, then you, you had to get the cannonball in there. Then you had to uh, put a little bit of gunpowder in the little primer cap. And then you had to have what's called a linstock, which was this sort of curvy metal rod. And there'd be like uh, some uh, little fuse that had pot potassium nitrate on it. And that would be stuck in there. And then you'd light it. And this thing would just jump, you know, you had this basic explosion. And these cannons blew up all the time because you had, you know, you had, a lot of times they would crack and this and that. So it was very, it was dangerous. It, I mean, a lot of uh, artillerymen were killed during the revolution on both sides because cannons would just blow up. Here's a, a, um, the question. I so, you know, a, a oh, I was just saying that. So. You know, Henry Knox had to be a hands-on guy. He had to be right in there with his troops, um, and he was through the whole world, whole war. Uh, William, I should probably know this, or I could have looked it up. But did these did these cannonballs explode? Is there TNT in the balls, or what happened? Um, yeah, I mean, some of them, some of them did. They would actually have, uh, the, you know, they were hollowed out, and they would put gunpowder in there, and then they would actually light a fuse. Huh. So. Then you'd mm. roll the cannonball down the muzzle of the cannon, and you had to fire it before that fuse got down. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Pressure is on is, with that. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it was crazy. And um, But, yeah, no, they, they had exploding shot, and they would put in a little shrapnel in them. And, uh, Ouch. You know, they were devastating. I mean, you got on the wrong side of them, for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's just so impressive that all that all that expertise and ar artillery and everything he got from this job that he got in a bookstore where he read a lot about military engineering and artillery and all these different That's things. Right. And I don't know, I'm so impressed by that. You know, in this day and age, I feel like I don't want to be a downer, but sometimes I feel like Americans have kind of lost some of that spirit of like, oh, yeah, I'll just go read a book about it. Or I guess nowadays I'll go watch a YouTube video and then I'll know how to do it. Now now I can, you know, just start my own army and I'll know how to use cannons and all this stuff or, or whatever it is. You know, I think so many Americans historically have been sort of self-taught uh, autodidacts. And, the, and, mm -hmm. and do you think do you think we still have that spirit where, you know, people just decide that they can do things so that so they can? 
Um, I think some people do, you know, Americans have become more risk averse, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, in the 18th century and 19th century, um, America, the the country was being built up and there wasn't this big structure for people to uh, plug into. Mm -hmm. So you would go out and try things all the time. You know, you would have, I mean, you look at uh, like Abraham Lincoln and these people, they they tried many things and failed. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, so, you know, what we would view as risk was sort of standard then you would go okay i'm gonna go be a printer or i'm gonna go try and start this store i'm gonna go do this um and uh you know now the equivalent of doing some of these things would be well i'm gonna go be an actress or a writer or whatever and people like oh that's very risky um uh so you know there is a price to pay for people being um more try and stay in more in the center Mm-hmm. And not and not do uh, thing. You know, I'm not sure how much people are told anymore. Oh, go follow your dreams. Go, right. go, go do that. I think the message a lot of people get is, uh, you know, do something that's going to give you an income and you can survive. And so, yeah, you can't blame people for that. But in Henry Knox's time, um, people were much more willing to take very high risk. And that was that sort of felt normal to them. I and mean, again, Henry Knox could have been hung at any time. Same with George Washington and all of them. Um, George Washington could have ridden out the war. His wife was l- loaded. He he could have just stayed on his plantation in Virginia and been just fine. Um, but you know, also to these pretty religious men, and so they didn't operate on the same plane as a lot of people do today. You know, they they sort of maybe a little more ethereal um Mm -hmm. death was a lot more common so that was uh just something that was there and so maybe they had a sense of hey this is my time you know now and i'm going to make the best of it but no i think i think the people who built the country up in the 19th century early 20th century probably were much more risk takers well yeah and the religious thing is interesting to me because i didn't know one thing i didn't realize until i um I was reading your book was um, that Henry Knox is actually related to John Knox of, you know, Scottish fame. And uh, I I had watched the Mary Queen of Scots movie recently, and he's in that John Knox, you know, and his uprisings and stuff. And I, I wonder, you know, that sense of like destiny and of religious um, calling to, to do these things and take these big risks and and find these causes like if that's something that you know that he saw as part of his like cultural history his his family history and his cultural history too well and you know his dad left him at a very early age so henry knox had to fend for himself from age nine on Mm -hmm. um but i i think though you know his zeal he 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 did Again, going back to what we said earlier, he did put the establishment of America, this place of freedom, liberty, um, on the same plane as his religious beliefs. So it became a holy quest. You know, the American Revolution was a holy quest, and then the noble train was a holy quest. And that's why I call it the noble train. Um, So what he believed they were doing was ordained by God. Mm -hmm. And so this would you know sustain him as he went through these incredible hardships of you know these three months of dragging these cannons all the way to boston um from fort ticonderoga and at times when he just probably thought he could go no further because in the book there's a lot more than we are talking about right. a lot more a lot more things happened to him and uh oh, right every know, day was a a whole adventure to itself in this in this expedition it, it really was it made an incredible movie when is that who has the movie rights now how about it right right now they're available um you know also too i will say destiny mm-hmm. you know i've written books on um teddy roosevelt the wright mm-hmm. brothers um edith wilson and Henry Knox. And one thing that I, and even Sally Rand, who I just, was the last book to come out. Everybody I've sort of studied, destiny plays in. There is, I mean, Teddy Roosevelt, when he went out west in the Badlands in 1883 after his mother and father died, mm-hmm. the name of that book is Fortune President. 
he should have been killed 20 times over right. by Indians, by all sorts of things. But he, he survived, and it was sort of for something higher. Same thing with Wilbur Wright, who actually invented that plane. He, he, you know, he did what nobody else could do. And it was, you know, and he was a guy who didn't go to school. He had no idea about engineering, yet he was able to dope out what nobody else could. Um, and, and so, you know, you start to have destiny. And so Henry Knox, it was his destiny to get these cannons because everything else in his life, you know, is fine, but this was his shining moment. This was his crossing the Delaware. And you can only explain these things of this was what they were meant to do. Yeah, it's so interesting. We watched uh, recently, Newt Gingrich has a movie out about George Washington called The First American. Uh, Mm -hmm. And we watched that recently. And um, they talk a lot in that about Providence and how George Washington saw, you know, Providence, this huge force in his life. And I I think there's something to that, that maybe, you know, God is taking special care of baby Mm -hmm. drunks in the United States of America, that that Mm -hmm. somehow these people were in the right place and and were able to do these things they really had no no right to be able to do. Nobody certified him in 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 cannons or or anything. It's it's really sort of incredible and and um and against all these odds that that Americans have been able to do things like this. So I I think it's it's great. And I'm so happy that you wrote this book and that we were we were able to talk about it today because it's um it's sort of a, a special topic in history that that you know, has deserved more attention for a long time. Yeah, it really has. And, um, you know, the reception has been great. Um, you know, done a, a lot of, a lot of media for it. And I think people's reactions, I didn't know that, you mm-hmm. know, <laughs> I never heard this story, you know, and uh, again, you know, what was out there when I sat down to write this book was I could only have a few primary sources. Um, you know, there was two retired or uh, one was retired Colonel, the other was a uh, lieutenant, um, and he wrote a, a treatise on it for the Department of Defense. And then the retired colonel wrote a little self-published book he worked on for a long time. And then you had Henry Knox's papers and his diary, and that was really it. Hmm. So I had to piece it together because a lot of people contradicted each other. So you had to kind of come down to, well, what made the most sense in terms of transporting these? How did he do this? And so, you know, I came up with a, when you read it, it's a very different story than you've been told through the kids' books and others. It's it's much harder. And, you know, he was not organized. He was making it up as he goes and even getting the oxen <laughs> and the cans were just a mess. And so I think, you know, readers will be amazed at how many things he overcame. Obviously, it's absolute, it's absolute, you know, pure candy for anybody who loves the Revolutionary War. It's it yes. pure pleasure in this, but it, you don't have to because it's also about leadership, like you just said, uh, resources, dealing with personnel, dealing with challenges for the first time, and um, you, you know, uh, and outward appearances while doing it, personal relations, the public relations as you're doing it. There's so much, so much involved with this impossible task, and also, you know, the audacity to believe that impossible tasks are possible. Right. There's so much in this book. I think people should get it. They can follow you on Twitter. You're at Rocketman46. Yeah, yeah. And uh, WilliamHazelgrove.com, which is there's a bunch of uh, media on Henry Knox on there. Um, And, you know, the book is everywhere. So, you know, you can just pop in my name or put in Henry Knox Noble Train um, and and you can find It it. It is um, well worth it. You know, a lot of folks, uh, you know, will be opening up soon, uh, hopefully, in this society in the next few months. But yeah. as of right now, this is a really good way to get educated on the birth of this country and um, on extraordinary people. The book is called Henry Knox's Noble Train, the story of a Boston bookseller's heroic expedition that saved the American Revolution. William Hazelgrove, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I just want to let your listeners know uh, the audio book just came out. So I know a lot of people like audiobooks, so that's been, you know, very popular. So, you know, if you just want to listen to it in your car, you can go ahead and get it. Awesome. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you.